Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to Agri-Food Conversations brought to you by iSelect Fund, the Van Trump Report, the Lab Institute, and Family Farms Group. My name is David Yoakum. I'm a principal on the iSelect Fund Ventures team, and I'm excited to welcome you to our discussion today. Uh, Agri-Food Conversations is all about driving innovation in agriculture. Each month, we highlight a specific theme, this month's theme being agroforestry. On today's call, we are joined by Elizabeth Hunter, COO and co-founder of TreeSwift. By combining drone data collection, advanced tree analytics, and, and a cloud data dashboard, TreeSwift provides forest stakeholders with precision data and analyses that are easily accessible and flexible. Its services are used in carbon capture estimation, timber value estimation, deforestation monitoring, advanced growth forecasting, and forest management. Now, each of you knows that companies are more likely to succeed with the right network of customers, talent, investors, and advisors. We've invited you to this call because you are some of the smartest, most talented people in TreeSwift's market. You're potential customers for TreeSwift's products and services. You have built a company similar to TreeSwift, or you have unique expertise and understand the challenges and opportunities that TreeSwift may face. Now, before we get started, uh, we have a quick poll question to get a better idea of who we have on the call today. Please take a few seconds to answer. And um, while that poll is running, um, a few process comments. Uh, we are not soliciting investment. This presentation is to provide information to help TreeSwift find customers, mentors, and other strategic relationships that can help them grow their business. You can use, a, use the Q&A box to ask a question at any time. We will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. And finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be available for replay. So without further delay, I am pleased to introduce Elizabeth Hunter, COO and co-founder of TreeSwift. Elizabeth, we're all eyes and ears. David, thanks so much for the terrific introduction and just for the invitation to, to be in the webinar today. Uh, just really happy to um, uh, tell you more about TreeSwift and really what we are uh, bringing to market in the forestry industry um, today um, and, and really how we're helping our customers across, across the United States. Uh, we're focused at present and so uh, just in this initial background in this slide, um, this is a typical forest that uh, one might see in the United States uh, Southeast. Um, and so this particular vantage point is uh, mostly from above, above the canopy. So above the treetops. Um, and really what we're focused on at, at TreeSwift is uh, building forestry's robots. Uh, so basically robots that can go into forests and other natural ecosystems to collect really rich data at scale that can be used in climate monitoring, timber volume estimation, forest fuels monitoring, um, and a whole host of, of other applications to uh, drive business value and strategic decision making for our customers. And so this is a robot that we're ac actively deploying um, across um, our customers' uh, timberlands. Um, this is uh, a video that was taken in a uh, loblolly pine forest in the U.S. Southeast. And so uh, some some folks in agroforestry might be interested might be interested and familiar with with drones and what they're able to do in forests today. But you'll notice that. Our drone is special and it's unique to forests in the sense that it can actually uh, operate underneath the forest canopy. Uh, so it's, it's not enough to uh, look at forests and to collect um, data about, about trees from underneath the canopy, but instead our drone that we've developed uh, goes underneath the canopy to measure trees at scale. And one of the reasons why we uh, really set out to solve this problem is that when you think about forests, they cover 31% of our planet. And so we're what we're building is, is really uh, uh, globally minded in the sense that we're looking at deploying robots to not only measure uh, one acre, a few acres, hundreds of acres of trees, but really millions of acres of trees. And this is so that we can better understand, sense, measure, uh, and, and better utilize uh, our forests. Uh, one thing that I'll just mention is that it's, it's, it's no um, surprise, I mean, the, the, that uh, forest fires and uh, various climate fluctuations um, have really 
have really put various uh, natural ecosystems at risk. And so this is just another driving force behind why we want better data, more data uh, about our forests and how we can scale that out. And so um, this is a typical forest where we deploy our technology today. Uh, we're providing a timber inventory service uh, to, our, to our landowner customers uh, where we measure timber volumes, uh, diameters of trees, heights of trees. Um, and again, just to kind of show the difference in the tree swift solution versus some of the other remote sensing technologies that have really been introduced in forestry today is this is an aerial image, so a top-down view of um, what might be captured from aerial photography or an overhead drone. And so you'll kind of see that you can, you know, you can see the crowns of the trees, you know, maybe you can get some tree counts and other things. You can cer certainly impute data uh, from, from this photograph, but what you're what you're missing is really everything underneath the canopy. So when we think about the juxtaposition between this aerial imagery and then basically what we're missing from uh, what's shown underneath the canopy, there's really this big gap. And how this is being solved today, this gap between what satellites can measure, what aerial photography can measure, um, and what we can see underneath the canopy is, is really with on the ground labor. So this is how trees um, are currently measured today. We wrap uh, diameter tapes and D tapes and pull out the tape to do, uh, to measure heights. Um, and this is a highly manual process that really only results in getting a very small sample of, of what's actually in the woods and what's, what, what's in the forest. And so the product that we're delivering today is a, is a full service forest inventory. Um, so this is an overview of our inventory process uh, where we basically go out and we have a data collection target for our under canopy drone. And then uh, tree swift operators go and uh, collect that data for our customers. We process that data into um, inventory analytics that our customers need to make business decisions. Um, and then we uh, develop a data ecosystem for them. So various tabular data sets, uh, various other uh, maps and forest reconstructions that then they can use um, in their forest management practices. And some of the data that we're gathering on every tree includes, you know, typical inventory data that one might be gathering from a, a standard uh, timber cruise or, or timber measurement operation like diameters, heights, tree counts. Uh, we're also capturing really rich semantic information like defects of the tree, merchantable quality, um, in the case of uh, carbon, carbon cruising or carbon measurements, missing biomass. Um, and we're providing all of this in reference to a geospatial digital map. So basically what TreeSwift measures is uh, transparent and verifiable from the sense that when we go out and measure a tree with our drone, we associate all of those measurements um, back to a particular map of where that, that tree is, is um, on the ground. This is how we actually go out and go about collecting our data and performing that service. Um, so this is, um, this is our drone. Uh, so this, this drone is TreeSwift specific. So this isn't necessarily a commercial off the shelf drone, but this has been designed specifically for use in forestry. It has a smaller than typical airframe, and this really allows us to get underneath the canopy and fly between those tree stems in a very efficient way. We have multiple sensors on our drone, so a, a, a really uh, rich sensor payload, including LIDAR, RGB cameras, and other sensors that we can extract all of those beautiful analytics from the stems. And this is ex an example um, taken from, from the vantage point of how the, how the drone actually flies underneath the canopy. 
And then to give a, uh, a completely different view, uh, this point of view is actually captured from onboard our drone. So this is our drone flying a particular uh, a forest uh, plot or a sample that we would measure in a uh, southeastern uh, Lobbelly pine forest. And you can see that it's really by getting uh, our drone underneath the canopy that we're able to capture all of that data that is, is really missed by some of those overhead technologies like satellites or aerial imagery alone. Um, and then we take all of that data that the drone collects and we process it through our algorithms um, and our data pipeline. So this is actually some of the data that we use um, in processing those, those analytics like diameters and heights and defects is that in the top panel, you can see our point cloud data that's from our LIDAR. You can see this beautiful forestry construction and that, um, and that from this forest reconstruction, we essentially create um, that digital record and that digital monument of where these trees are in space, which is, is really critical to driving transparency and verifiable measurements, especially when we think about measuring forest carbon uh, and the need for um, monumented and verified uh, measurements for, for carbon assets that are, that are sold in offsets. We also use imagery as, as part of our, our data uh, pipeline. So you can see the bottom panels populated with images um, and so we don't just use one sensor alone, but uh, multiple sensors. And so currently uh, we, we deliver these, these metrics in tabular format to a variety of forest stakeholders, uh, land managers, landowners, um, investors interested in forest carbon. Um, and we, we have a, uh, a growing team in order to facilitate um, uh, all of all of this operational scaling that we're we're um, experiencing right now, and so um, really, I'm just excited to uh, to chat more, David, and and to open it up for for Q and A if if there's uh, any questions, and then um, this is this is how folks can reach us through social channels and and get in touch uh, as well. Awesome. Elizabeth, really interesting presentation, really uh, interesting data and exciting products that you've showcased here. Um, as Elizabeth uh, alluded to, if you do have questions, the best way to, to ask a question is to type it in the Q&A box, not the chat window. Please type them in the Q&A box so I keep them all organized. Um, but Elizabeth, I, one thing I'm curious about, um, so one of the there's there's two two areas that I understand to be major challenges in, in forest management, in, particularly in the, in the West. Um, as we start to see a lot of climate change induced increased risk of forest fire, it that also compounds with some of the challenges of undermanaged forests over perhaps like the last 20, 30 years or longer. Um, so one of the one of the big issues that I've heard is really challenging to deal with is one, how do we detect whether or not the conditions are right in a certain area in order to conduct a controlled burn of some kind or a prescribed burn? Like, so that we don't send the crews out there and then all of a sudden the crews get there and the conditions are not optimal for doing a prescribed burn. So that's like one, one uh, area I've heard is a challenge. And the second is around faster detection of fires when they occur so that, that you can basically just take a much more rapid, um, uh, much more rapid action and prevent like these massive fires from burning out of control. Can you speak to sort of how your product might fit in the scope of those two challenges? Yeah, definitely. I and, and this is something that we we have also kind of heard about um, just from various groups that we've spoken with as well. And kind of the the first that I'll I'll speak to is is really kind of in in terms of the conditions and it being uh, right for a prescribed burn and other things. It, it's really a, a matter of, um, you know, if, if, when we think about our, especially tree swift technology and how it can really propel forward the uh, uh, forest fuel data collection. Um, what, what we've heard is that it, the, the data sets and kind of the, the kind of the knowns or the certainty of, of kind of what's there as you as you mentioned some, some of these practices you know kind of 
over, over various decades, kind of not necessarily having updated information. Um, we really view it as um, we just don't know kind of enough about what's there. And so I think, um, especially with something like with our technology, that's one of the reasons why we've developed this under canopy solution is that you can't, you just can't see enough about these fuels from over top of over top of the crowns of the trees. Yeah. And, and so we're really facilitating kind of that uh, transparency and that scalable way of getting data efficiently and um, and updating these types of, of data sets as well. And so yeah. I think that's um, it's definitely kind of one way our technology could address that. Interesting. Um... What one thing, you know, seeing some so the the when you were showing the actual footage of the drone flying through the uh, under the canopy and the sort of color scales that were being shown there, was that LIDAR data or was that something else that in terms of what the color scale means? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'll just flip back uh, quickly so you can see the the colors too. So in the, the top panel here. Um, it's shown uh, LIDAR data from the LIDAR sensor, and this is a reconstruction. This is, this is actually kind of a semi-processed uh, data. This isn't necessarily the raw data that's coming out of the sensor. Um, but the, the reason why it's colorized is because there's uh, various intensities, um, basically, of the of the lidar, so it's essentially a, a distance. Right. Um, so okay. a distance Close, closer and further away. Gotcha. You got it. Okay, um, that's interesting. It, so one one thing it makes me think of. So like I I in college coincidentally took a lot of classes with a lot of forestry students, and so like um, you know forest forest management and the people who taught forest management and who were these you know career foresters. There was a I got the sense that there was this combination of kind of like yes data, but also like feel and like local knowledge. And, mm -hmm. um, and and I'm curious to know what, how that impacts in terms of how you guys communicate your product, either in the sales process or just like how it ends up fundamentally working with what I would consider to be like a, somewhat of like a legacy industry in terms of the way things are are managed and operated, especially since like like it makes so much sense for technology to be used to manage forests in this way because forests are so massive and like hard to scale human labor. So how does, how does that, how do those two end up going together and where do you like see challenges in terms of them getting it and like adopting it? Yeah, so this is a, you know, in our experience, um, this is a really rich space for technology development and the forestry industry is hungry for it. You know, I think a lot of the technologies in particular that, um, you know, that have, have really tried to that have or that have been adopted specifically for agriculture yeah. and then uh, try to you know find their place in forestry it's always been kind of a force fit right and so um, that's one of the approaches like we have taken is that we're, we're developing forestry's robots, these new tools. And we're also very committed as an organization to also adding, adding these types of tools to the foresters, um, you know, knowledge base and toolkit. So we are still sending, you know, when we go out to the field to collect data, we're still sending boots on the ground. We um, have a, a, a diverse team of not only engineers, technologists, but we have GIS leaders, operations experts, um, and foresters as well. Um, because at the end of the day, there are those experiences. We incorporate the, as many of those as we can into the product. But there are some things, you know, you just have to go to the field and see. But that's yep. another reason why we focused on this digital record. So, you know, in, in some areas, of, you know, a forester might put 50,000 miles on their truck um, every year going out to the woods to inspect forests, to kind of see what's going on, to uh, prescribe new management practices. And so with TreeSwift's data, if we are cruising 
um, on, uh, on, this, on a landowner's land on a regular cadence, they're able to see kind of their forest in, in a virtual way as well um, and kind of get a heads up of what's out there. So we kind of think about it as, as really it's, it's an additive benefit and this is just another tool for the forester. Yep. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I do have some follow-up questions on that, but we have two questions from the audience that I want to address first. Um, the first one is Loblolly forests, as in like Loblolly pines, I believe, um, have good tree spacings, but is there a limit on drones flying in very dense canopies or understories? Yeah, so um, there is a uh... There is certainly a, a limit um, in what we we can fly in, and that's we we have other sets of technologies and other ways to deploy our, our sensors under canopy um, at, as well, besides drones. But in terms of um, the density and and other things, uh, I you know in this kind of example, I showed mostly lavalli pine. Um, we have operated in Pacific Northwest, we've operated in hardwood forests, there's a range, but um, really when trees are very young, kind of in the early stages of the rotation, like early to mid stages of the rotation, just some forest, forested stands are, are simply too dense. I mean, you, can, you can't even walk through them, let alone fly through them. Right. However, we do, have, um, we do have other approaches kind of to those, those forest types as well. Gotcha, thanks Elizabeth. Um, second question, um, great technology, what's the business model? Yeah, so we, op we operate as a, a, a service and then also software as a service uh, model. And so essentially we perform um, the end-to-end -end cruising services for uh, landowners. So our, our target uh, customers right now are really in uh, commercial timberland owners, managers, um, also um, other Timberland um, managers and owners, even if it's not commercial as well. And so we go out, we perform the data collection analytic surfaces, and then provide that data back to the customer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, one thing on the, um, that I was curious about on the LIDAR side of things, um, there's been a number of companies that have are using LIDAR as a way of measuring biomass in forests, um, principally to do like carbon estimation um, and think about either reforestation carbon credits to be a, be a piece of that story or for like to get people compensated for reforestation projects. Is that something that you guys are looking into or, or see as a, as a viable opportunity? Yeah, so I think one of the super exciting things about, about forests is that they're no longer only kind of thought about for timber, but they're this, um, they're really one of the biggest opportunities for nature-based climate solutions, right? So um, essentially in mitigating climate change, what we really see is our data sets really um, forming the, the bedrock for, for what is the most transparent and kind of verifiable monitoring technology for a lot of these uh, new carbon projects that are, are being spun up by various groups. And so um, one of the, I think the unique things about how we're deploying the LIDAR, not only the LIDAR, but the other sensors as well, is that we're doing this under canopy. And one of the things that's done in these carbon projects is that um, there needs to be physical monuments actually placed in the woods to ensure um, the additionality of those of those mm, credits and um, that you know the, the, the trees are, are still standing you know after um, you know the the verification and the remeasurement happens after the baseline measurements and so how we think about this is that we're, we're really facilitating that transparency of data by providing this digital, um, digital record that's essentially monumented uh, in virtual space. Um, and that can be readily seen without, not, without necessarily having to go make a trip um, to see the physical monument on the ground. Gotcha, good point um, on the additionality piece. Um, the, one thing I'm always interested in um, analytics tools, either in the context of agriculture or other like uh, just 
digital tools to describe physical environments. Um, so like I'll give an example of like, the question I want to ask you is, is what's when, when you show a customer your product and the data and the, in the sort of layers that you can show them, I'm curious to know what the, like, what's like the no brainer part where they go, Oh, that's awesome. I've been like dying to see that. And I'll give an example of like what I'm talking about. There's a, there's a company um, called earth optics and they do really, um, awesome high fidelity soil carbon mapping. And some of their customers have just, there's 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 a lot of other tools out there for doing soil carbon estimation that aren't very good, um, not very high fidelity. And they are able to build these really awesome comprehensive maps of like the of the gradient of, of soil carbon in the soil. And their customers have just never seen this before. And they just go, oh my God, like that's awesome. Like I've never seen data in this way before. It's so like, what's like a component of your product that that you get that kind of reaction from from your customers? It's the under canopy data. Yeah. So I think um, one of, you know, a lot of, you know, this, this, this kind of uh, field of remote sensing and LIDAR data or even aerial photography, it's always been thought of, you know, by foresters and in this industry as something that can only be captured from above canopy. And one of the reasons why those technologies and specifically satellites are just insufficient in kind of solving this uh, transparent measurement uh, challenge is because of that under canopy kind of penetration yeah. and what you can see. And so it's actually going back to the colorful point cloud that you asked about, we show these reconstructions, it's, it, it, it's really kind of this aha moment for a lot of people that this is a technology that we have specifically um, designed for forestry because the under canopy piece has just been missed for so long. Yeah. And what, what's, the, what's the most common like decision or set of decisions that foresters or forest managers would make based on that under canopy data? Like what do they go and say like, oh, let's do this thing that we weren't doing before or they have the confidence to make a decision they couldn't make before? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really wide ranging. So I will say in terms of this, um, this essentially this under canopy data, it fits directly into our customers forest inventory system. So essentially, every time they're going, go, going to go out and remeasure a forest or baseline measure it, they're using these measurements in this inventory across their entire organization to figure out what is going on with this forest and what they should do next. And so, you know, a few of those decisions, uh, you know, might be it's, it's, it's harvest, you know, this goes into their harvest and yield estimation. So how these trees are gonna grow for the next yeah. 15 years, you know, forests grow on a 30 year rotation. It's not like a annual crop like corn or soybeans where it's going to be, you know, turned over year after year. So these are long-term decisions. So this is why the data is really critical to get from under the canopy. And one of the other things that we're getting is the semantic information. So how a tree is growing, if it has defects, if various trees have, have died, if some of them might have um, some inferior genetics that have caused them to fork in certain ways. Yeah. All of this affects the volume of biomass that landowners have in the forest and whether they want to figure out the value of their forest from a timber measurement standpoint or from a bio measure, biomass measurement standpoint to uh, figure out carbon sequestration, the data fits all along those value chains. Yeah, super exciting, super, super exciting. Um, Elizabeth, uh, last question I wanna ask you, um, where do you guys need the most help? Uh, how can the audience uh, help you and how can they reach you? Thanks, David. Um, yeah, I was um, just super excited if, if folks are, are interested in reaching out specifically, uh, we're hiring. So we're a growing, we're a growing team. So um, you can head to our, our website that's listed on this on the screen and check out our careers page. Um, and I really love that a lot of these uh, questions in this Q&A focused on on carbon as well. I think we're, we're always keen to, to chat with folks that maybe are developing those carbon projects and, and really if there's, if there's opportunity to kind of get involved um, with, with forest inventory, 
um, if there's any kind of landowners um, in the audience too, um, we would love to kind of hear from you and about your needs and how we might be able to help you with your inventory. Awesome. Well, um, Elizabeth, we really, really appreciate your time today. Um, super exciting and important work that you guys are doing at Tree Swift. Um, and yeah, forest management is something near and dear to my heart. And I, I hope there can be more better tools to, to do this kind of stuff um, going forward. Um, uh, for everybody in the audience today, thank you for your time as well. Um, for anybody who is new uh, to this webinar, either now or listening on recording, um, we host Agri-Food Conversations um, every Thursday at um, 3 p.m. Central Time. Um, a replay of this is gonna be emailed to you in the next 24 hours and new viewers can go, uh, can register for Agri-Food Conversations by going to agrifoodconversations.com. Um, next month, we're gonna be covering uh, companies using artificial intelligence and machine learning in agriculture. Obviously a lot of applications there, uh, but excited for, um, for the month coming. And um, Elizabeth, thank you for your time today. Thanks so much, David, this was great. Thanks, bye.